I just know that this is the truth of the word. This is the truth that we all have to embrace. We have to press on towards the prize and get rid of the distractions because we have a job to do. Now, chapter 12 of Acts, last week, we did not cover the last verse. And the reason we didn't cover the last verse is because I personally believe, and I could be wrong, but if I were to write the, the New Testament, and uh, I was given the, the honor of labeling the numbers and verses, I would have had verse 25 of chapter 12 be the first verse of chapter 13. That's just me. I could be wrong. And um, please don't think that I'm telling God he made a mistake because actually when the Bible was written, it didn't have verses and, t- and chapters. It read like a letter. So um, uh, just take it for what it's worth. I'm just uh, kidding around. But starting at verse, tw- verse 25 of chapter 12, it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. And they also took with them John, whose surname is Mark. And this is the Mark that, this is the Mark that uh, wrote the New Testament, St. Mark. Um, and that's the book, the, the Gospel of Mark. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, who was called Niger, Niger, uh, Lucius of Canaan, of uh, Cyrene, and Manan, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work of which to which I have called them. They're praying, they're fasting, they're serious. Praying and fasting means they're serious. They're really, they're, this is serious work. They're doing the Lord's work. And they're all together. All these guys are together. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, hey, I need Saul and Barnabas. Pull them out of the group because I have a mission for them. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Cilicia. And from there, they sailed to Cyprus. And then they arrived in Sel- uh, Salam- Salamis. They, reached, they preached the word of God in the syn- synagogue of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Now when they had gone through this, the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul. Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man, this man called for, called for Barnabas and Saul to, so, and sought to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the sorcerer, for so his name translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called what Paul. Here we have the introduction to Paul. Saul is Paul. Filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, the sorcerer, who was trying to pull the proconsul away from the word of God. Paul said to him, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight way of the Lord? And now indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. 
Then the proconsul believed when he saw that he had, when they saw what he had done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Paul is doing the work of the Lord. Let me have a map real quick. I'm going to show you something. I love the way Paul travels around. Here's Paul. He is. Um, oh, my camera finally died. Okay. Oh, it's hard to show you now, but uh, Cyprus, uh, you probably can't see it, but it's amazing the truck. He goes up the mainland, up by Cilicia, and he shoots down on a boat, goes to Cyprus, uh, the top end of Cyprus, then he walks through Cyprus to the bottom end of Cyprus, and then he's going to cruise up uh, the Mediterranean, up in that little pocket there. And then he's going to go up from there. So he, he's traveling a lot to preach the gospel. Now, this one thing I do, he said, this one thing I do, I press on towards the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. The, the, the upward call, part of the upward, upward call is to preach the gospel. That's what we are supposed to do. All of us are supposed to share the message of the good news of Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus died for your sin. He wants to forgive you of all your sins. He wants to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He wants to prepare your heart to go to heaven. He wants to take you with him into paradise to spend eternity with him. That's the good news. And that's our focus, our goal. That is what we're here on earth for. If, if, that's, if we got saved and that wasn't our job, then the Lord would have just got us saved and taken us home. So why did he leave us here? He left us here to promote the kingdom, to grow the church, to bring salvation to the lost. That's why he brought us here. And so here is Paul now heading out for the ministry that he was called to by the Holy Spirit, leaving his friends, forgetting what was behind, pressing on, and then he meets what? A sorcerer. And what is the sorcerer doing with Paul's mission? Paul's work. He's distracting. He's distracting from the mission. He's pulling away from the mission. He's working against the mission. And Paul, when he finds this sorcerer, pulling the pro council away from the work that Paul is doing and bringing the word of God, what Paul does is he says, oh, come on, don't bother us. Can't you just leave us alone? I'm just trying to do some the Lord's work. Oh, don't, don't, don't do this. Is that what he did? No, this is what he did. Oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you sons of the devil, you enemy of righteousness. <laughs> he's pressing on. He's not carrying baggage around. He's not saying, oh, they're always picking on me. I never can get my work done. Have you ever met a Christian like that? Oh, <laughs> I have. Hey, brother, how you doing? Well, you know, you know. No, I don't know. <laughs> Hey, sister, how's it going? Well, you know. Here's Paul. Hey, how's it going, Paul? Well, these guys are picking on me. They're ruining their... I'm trying to do the Lord's work. It's a real hassle. Everyone's against me. No. Oh, full of deceit and all fraud, you sons of the devil, you enemies of all righteousness, you will not cease perverting the straight way of the Lord. And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind and not see the sun for a long time. Oh, okay. I'll leave you alone. Wow. You wouldn't believe this, but we have to deal with people sometimes that are distracting from the work of the Lord. Even here at Club Zion, you don't think the devil sends people here? Yeah. Even people that 
appear, have the appearance of knowing the word of God, but yet come to distract and to draw away and to pollute the word of God. Now, I thought about when I was studying this that I was going to memorize verse 10 and use it someday. I'm going to memorize verse 10, and I'm going to say, oh, full of deceit. <laughs> okay, I'm out of here. None of you, of course. You're all beautiful people that love the Lord Jesus. You sons of the devil. You enemies of righteousness. Paul. He's not going to deal with distractions. It ain't going to happen. Why? He's on a mission. And if we, as we study the book of Acts, we see how Saul, Paul, has already been hassled a lot. Does he go home crying? No. He presses on. Why? He's forgetting what lies behind. Verse 10, verse 12. Then the proconsul believed when he was, that when he, they saw what was done, had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. When now when Paul and his party set sail for Paphos, they came to Perga in the Pamphylius, Pamphylia, and John departed from them, returning to Jerusalem. Now, Perga is kind of up in that little bowl up in that corner of, and right up above that is, is uh, I loved my map, but they're gone. <sighs> Verse 14, but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Poseidon. And this is back when we were talking about Antioch uh, above Jerusalem on the mainland. I said there's another Antioch mentioned in Acts. And this is the one that, that this one is uh, just above Perga. Uh, I love the, the whole region and looking into it. The maps are incredible. I love it. Antioch of Poseidon. And went into the synagogue on the, on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after they, the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent for them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say now, say, say on, like bring it on. Then Paul stood up and motioned with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, Listen. Anybody ever watch Charles Stanley? Anybody ever watch him? What, there's two things Charles, Charles Stanley always says. What does he say? Listen. He always says, listen. Listen. Watch this. Listen. Listen. And he begins to tell them about themselves. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exhorted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. He's remembering, bring them back to the history. Let's look at our history, people. Now, for a time of about 40 years, he put up with their way in the wilderness. What was their way in the wilderness? He put up with their way in the wilderness. They were stiff-necked, rebellious, and out of control. He put up with that. I like that. You know why I like that? Because it gives me hope of God putting up with me. Verse 19. And when he had, when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. After that, he gave them judges for about four, 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. 
And when he had removed him, he raised up for them king, raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, God gave testimony and said about David, I have found favor, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. For this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a savior, Jesus. So he's, he's bringing them back to the Old Testament. Everything he's saying is stuff they already know. He's reminding them of their history. And, and they, when they go to the synagogue, every single time they go to the synagogue, the prophets are read. The Psalms are read. And so they know this stuff. Verse 24, after John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all people of Israel. Remind them of, them of John the Baptist, how he came and was telling them about the repentance of sin. Verse 25, as John finished his course, he said, Woe, who do you think I am? I am, I am not he. But behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, Jesus, nor even nor even the voice of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. He's reminding them that Jesus and everything that was done for Jesus was foretold by the prophets. Everything I'm telling you, the prophets already said, and it happened with Jesus. Verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. He was seen by many, he was seen by many, he was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee and Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings that promises, that promises which was made to our fathers talking about the scriptures, the prophecies about Jesus Christ, the promises of the Savior to come, the promises. And if you ever do a study on the prophecies of Jesus Christ, you'll be blown away. Everything that happened to Jesus and everything he was is foretold before he ever was. Even when, when his mother and father took him down to, G, to Egypt, it's in, the prophet, it's, in the, in the, it's in the writings of the prophets. Everything. Every detail, even Isaiah describes the crucifixion to a T. Isaiah, before it ever happened. And verse 33 says, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus as it also, as is also written in the second Psalms. And Psalms, he, he quotes Psalms, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, and he, he says, he repeats again, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another Psalm, you will not, I will not, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. And that means that God will not allow the body of Jesus Christ to decay. And so he's telling the Jewish audience about the scriptures, bringing them back to the prophecies. Verse 36, for David, after he has served his, his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, means he died, was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. David fell asleep. David died and he saw corruption. His body decayed. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that though this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sin, through this man, the, 
is preached to you the forgiveness of sin. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could be justified, that you could not be justified by the law. So the law could never justify you. Keeping the Ten Commandments can't get you to heaven. Uh, Killing bulls and goats can't get you to heaven. Uh, Burning incense can't get you to heaven. Nothing of the Old Testament can get you to heaven. Verse 40, beware therefore. Nothing can get you to heaven except for Jesus. Nothing of your traditions, nothing of Moses can get you to heaven. Do you know a lot of people today think if I'm good enough, I can go to heaven? Heaven has nothing to do with being good. Zero. You can't be good enough. The qualifications to go to heaven is to be as good as Christ. That's the qualifications. Without being perfect, you can't go to heaven. That's why Jesus died for you, because you're incapable of being good. Yeah, you are incapable of being good. The Bible, the Ten Commandments declares, if you break one sin, you're breaking them all. You can't bank on that. And he's telling them, this ain't going to work for you. You need a Savior. Verse 39, and by him, Jesus, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore. Based, the therefore is based, it means based on everything I just said, beware, lest what has been spoken in the prophets comes upon you. Meaning, it's not going to work out very well at all for you. Your eternal, eternity, your eternal destiny is in jeopardy. He's laying this out for them. Verse 30, 41, he says, Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were two Declare it to you. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath... Almost the whole city came together to hear the words of God. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and contradicting the, and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Distractions. Trying to do the Lord's work, distractions. Trying to do the Lord's work, distractions. How many distractions do you have in your life? Paul was constantly being distracted, constantly. But this one thing he did, watch verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold. Everybody's picking on me. Maybe Barnabas, should we go back to Jerusalem? They were nice to it there. Come on, Barnabas, let's get out of here. Paul doesn't accept distractions. It's not a part of him. Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first because the the scriptures were clear. Salvation was to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Now, a lot of Christians wonder, well, the Jews are all going to be saved. No, they're not. Well, this one verse here tells us they're not all going to be saved. But if you look at the account in the wilderness, God said when they were going over the Jordan that those stiff-necked unbelievers are not saved. The only thing that gets you saved is Jesus Christ, period. 
Jesus said himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man or woman comes to me except through, no man comes to the Father except through me, he said. Through me. So here they are, they're, they're denying Christ. And Paul is laying it out for them. It was necessary that I preach to you first because the scriptures told me to. But since you reject it, what? Reject the gospel. Since you reject it and, ju and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. You rejected it. Now you judge yourselves everlasting life. Behold, we turn to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us. And then, he, and then he quotes what the Lord had given him. I have sent you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, now he's, he's blessed in the Jew, Jewish audience right there. Man, he lays it out there. And after the Gentiles who were there listening to it heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and chief men of the city raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Chapter 13. They came against adversity. They came against distractions. They came against things that would shut them down, wear them out, discourage them, or make them want to quit. And instead, they became bolder and stronger and more faithful to proclaim the word of God. Now, what slows you down? What distractions are in your life that you can't tell people about the greatest treasure of the universe? Jesus Christ the son of the living God, able to cleanse and purify your heart from sin and make you prepared for a gem for everlasting life in the kingdom of God. What holds you back from sharing such a victory? Ask yourself, hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord God, that we can trust your word. I thank you, Lord God, that it's a, it's a definite Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Forgive us, Lord, of all the distractions, all these things that work against us, Lord, things that will never matter in the end. We worry about our jobs. One day, we won't have a job. We'll be in the kingdom. We worry about, we worry about our health. Lord, one day we'll have a perfect body with no illnesses. We worry about our finances when our Heavenly Father owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Lord, you have all the resources we could ever need or want. And Lord, we worry about what people think of us when you think we're awesome. And what, what does it matter what people think if you, the God of all creation, thinks we're marvelous? Hallelujah. So Lord, all these distractions that plague us, all these things that worry us, Help us, Lord God, to leave it at your feet, to just take the baggage, take the garbage bags, and let go of it, Lord. Let us have peace in our heart and guard our minds, Lord, that we could be about your business, doing your will. Father, we love you and we need you. We're frail, we're fragile, we're weak, and Lord, we are so easily distracted. But let today's message be hope. Let today's message set us free, Lord God. And let us be like Paul, who was able to say this one thing I do, forgetting those things that lie behind, but I press on towards the prize, the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. And all God's people said,
Amen. Let's stand for a closing song.